Thank you for joining us for another Bible study video as we turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Today we'll be talking about something that falls under the heading of apologetics. Now, the word apologetics does not mean an apology. What it means is an answer, and it's from the Greek word apologia. That is the word that is used in 1 Peter 3.15, where the Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so when we discuss apologetics, we are basically trying to prepare you to give an answer to those who may bring up questions to what you believe concerning the Scriptures. And as you know, there are many different religions, denominations out there who have very different understandings of the Scripture. We want to know what the Bible says, and then we want to be able to defend it. That's apologetics. So today, under the heading of apologetics, let's talk about Mary. Mary was a great woman. She was highly favored of God and chosen to be the earthly vessel that delivered the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. So we would never besmirch Mary. She was a great and godly individual whom God used. But are the claims that the Catholic Church make about Mary the truth? According to the scriptures, they are not. Many denominations or religions build upon certain figures other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and that presents a very dangerous scenario, such as the Mormons. They will plainly tell you that the whole of Mormonism rises and falls on the testimony of Joseph Smith. Well, Catholicism has done very similar things with figures such as Mary. And they've taken Mary and elevated her to a status, a position that the Bible does not attribute to Mary. So while being a great and godly woman who was used of the Lord, they have taken and they have misconstrued that and created a danger by elevating Mary uh, really almost to the place of being a god herself as they seek for Mary to pray for her. And when they do that, uh, they are speaking to Mary. Um, that is essentially praying to her, even though many cases they'll try and say they don't pray to Mary. They are asking Mary to go to the Lord on their behalf. That is prayers to the dead. And the Bible strictly prohibits praying or speaking to the dead. And so there's a lot of issues that come about. But one of the things that they attribute to Mary is that she is a perpetual virgin. And that somehow her perpetual virginity gives her some sort of status that um, would be lost if she had other children. Well, the teaching of the Bible is this, that she did have other children. That doesn't make Mary a bad person. As a matter of fact, we're going to see in Scripture today that it's good that she had other children with her husband. But for the Catholic faith, this is a sticking point because they teach of her perpetual virginity, that this gives her that elevated status with the Lord as not only being whom they consider the quote-unquote mother of God, but also having this status of perpetual virginity. You do not find this in scriptures. As a matter of fact, here recently I was challenged by a precious Catholic lady that I was trying to witness to. She said, when you read the Bible, you will not find anywhere where Jesus had other siblings and Mary had other children. Now, what that told me is that this woman does not read the Bible because there are places that speak about the siblings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start first of all in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 3 and verse number 31 we read concerning Jesus, there came then his brethren and his mother and standing without sent unto him calling him. And the multitude sat about him and they said unto him, Behold thy mother 
and thy brethren without seek for thee? And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. So we read in the Gospels about the siblings of the Lord Jesus, the half-siblings, if you will, because um, we know that Jesus, being virgin-born, was directly the Son of God, as Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Ghost, and the rest of these children are natural children. Now, the defense of the Catholic Church against this idea of them being the actual siblings of Christ is that these are not brothers and sisters, but rather these are cousins. Now, let me just say that the Bible does not say cousins. It says brothers. Okay, so I think that we could start there by taking that argument off the table just by simply trusting the scripture. But there is another point that makes a greater impact in demonstrating this truth. In John chapter 2, we find that Jesus goes into the temple and cleanses the temple because of the things that they were doing, making the temple a place of merchandise. And when Jesus goes in, according to John chapter 2 and verse 17, the Bible says that the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And so they made this application of a messianic psalm to the Lord Jesus concerning the zeal of this house as they made it a place of merchandise instead of a house of prayer. They attributed that to the Lord Jesus. You can find a lot of truth by just simply going back to these Old Testament quotes and reading around them and seeing what else it says. If we would go back to Psalm 69 and verse number 8, the Bible says this, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me." So this passage that the disciples are thinking about as they watch the Lord run out the money changers and cleanse the temple goes back to this psalm that focuses on Christ and refers to His mother's children. Now, I don't think you can really get from point A to point B in Mark chapter 3 by saying that those brothers are not brothers but actually cousins. But there's no way around Psalm 69 where we read about his mother's children. But then the third thing that we would bring up is that later on in Scripture by revelation of the Apostle Paul, we actually read that it would be a bad thing if Mary is married to Joseph for her to withhold herself from him is not a good thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 3, the Bible says, Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourself to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And so we read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that it would actually be a bad thing for Mary to withhold herself from her husband, Joseph. So the question again, is Mary a perpetual virgin? Well, according to the scripture, which we find in Mark 3, in John chapter 2, comparing that with Psalm 69, and then just the spirit of 1 Corinthians 7, the answer would have to be no. She was not. She had other children. She was used of God, but the scriptures never elevate her to the point that Catholicism does. This is basic apologetics. As you go into the world and you face other people, or maybe some of you yourselves, came out of a Catholic background. Maybe you have family, friends. 
When they bring questions like this to you, such as Mary being a perpetual virgin, you should be ready to give a biblical answer. And the greatest way to do that is to familiarize yourself with this Bible. God bless you.